think we could get started. Um, and as more people join, I'll do my best to um, to notice them and, and, and admit them in. I want to thank everybody very much for being here with me tonight. Um, I'm State Representative Kate Lippergera Bedian, and I'm really honored and appreciative of the panelists who've uh, agreed to join us to have an important conversation around criminal justice during COVID-19. Uh, I want to thank those of you in the community who expressed interest in this conversation and submitted some really great questions in advance. One thing I want to flag for you at the outset is that the House Broadcasting Service is going to record um, the presentations tonight, just so that folks who are unable to participate and join us today can can you can use the information down the road. Um, if you are at all uncomfortable with that, first of all, my understanding is you won't be part of the broadcast. Um, they're going to be. Um, looking only at the speakers and the presentations, but you're also welcome um, to turn off your video at any time um, if that's more comfortable to you. Um, so I think, Becca, with that, you can probably record on our end as well. Um, and we can get started. So the idea for this first community conversation uh, really generated out of some different uh, communications that I had from constituents from the very beginning when I was sworn in just about six months ago uh, through a few weeks ago, uh, just questions of concern about our incarcerated population during COVID-19 and the public health ramifications uh, for those, those persons, uh, as well as more recently, some interest around a particular um, situation that involved the bail system. And so I reached out to some of the content experts who are here to talk with us tonight, and they um, kindly offered to put this together with me so that we could explore some of the uh, questions around the different government agencies that administer our criminal laws um, and, uh, and so forth. So that includes obviously our local police departments, our prosecutor's offices, and our houses of correction. Um, we only have an hour tonight, and based on the questions that you all uh, provided, I know you're really thinking critically about criminal justice as well as its intersection with many other areas of public interest. For example, um, we're at a moment in time where there is significant attention and conversation happening in our local communities at the state level and nationally around law enforcement. And there's absolutely a critical intersection between law enforcement protocols and our criminal justice system. Um, but for the purposes of tonight, I just say that we'll mostly be focusing on criminal justice um, and the application of our, our laws in that situation or in that paradigm and not on uh, law enforcement because we just don't have the time. But that doesn't mean we can't have another conversation. It's certainly the case that I've been in um, lots of conversations with you over email and the phone and so forth about law enforcement. And obviously there's been a lot of attention on that in my role as a state rep and I've been communicating about that in my newsletters. Uh, but as you'll see, and as it was uh, phrased in the registration form that you all filled out, we're going to look a lot at questions around pre-incarceration and pre-conviction considerations, uh, the incarcerated population and how we're moving to, towards decarceration efforts, and then continuity of care when folks re-enter um, uh, our communities. Um, so, you know, if we don't get to all the questions that were asked ahead of time, um, please know that we will follow up with you um, and you're also as questions come to you that we may not be able to get to tonight, you're welcome to put them in the chat function to me. I'll create a record and make sure that we follow up as well. Um, so again, thank you for being here tonight and I think we'll turn now to some introductions uh, from our panelists. So I'm very pleased to be joined tonight by Melrose Police Chief Michael Lyle. Uh, the Middlesex District Attorney, Marion Ryan, and the Middlesex uh, Sheriff, Peter Katusian. And uh, I think what we could do is just start before we turn over to our conversation topics with just a little introduction from each of you, maybe talking a little bit about your professional background and the work that your agency undertakes in the criminal justice system. And then I, I think we'd all be interested to hear a little bit about how COVID is impacting the work that you're doing in serving our communities. So maybe we'll start tonight with Chief Lyle um, and hear from you a little bit. And you'll need to unmute yourself now. How's that for a sound test? Perfect. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Lyle. I'm, I'm the police chief of the city of Melrose. For those folks that are from outside the city, I'm a lifelong resident. Uh, my wife as well. Uh, we live up at Mount Hood. If nobody knows where Mount Hood is. It's a beautiful golf course in the summer. In the winter, it's a winter wonderland. 
We live in a little street off of uh, Slayton Road, which is the direct route there. It's Angela Circle. Most people do know where I live, and now all you folks do know. Um, I've been in law enforcement for 34 years. I went to the Somerville Police Academy way back in 1986. Uh, I have attained the rank of Sergeant Lieutenant, and fortunate enough, uh, by the good graces of Mayor Dolan, I was appointed to Chief of Police in 2007, and, and that's where I've held this position since then. Uh, we're a community of approximately 28,000 people, a diverse community, and a good community. We have our problems just like every other community in the Commonwealth, but to some degree less in some areas and more so in others, which is calls for service. During the pandemic, I will say that the police department has seen a, a fair increase in domestic related calls, which is kind of surprising and um, it bothers us all. We have a dedicated detective just for domestic violence calls for that reason. Um, he is His name is Dan Ellers and he can be reached through our website if anybody know someone that's having troubles or are looking for advice, it's dellers at the city of Melrose.org. And every other officer in the building is the same, first initial, last name. And you can get everybody's information through our website, melrosepolice.com, .net, or .org. And that's enough of me, and I think we'll move on to our next panelist. Thank you, Chief. And yes, thank you, DA, please take it away. All right, thank you. I want to thank Representative Lipper Garavidian for really taking on this idea of having the conversation and putting it together and bringing us all here to talk about just a lot of the different things that have happened during the pandemic. I'm the district attorney in Middlesex County. I have spent almost my entire professional career in that office, working my way from doing cases that involve really pretty simple things in the district court to prosecuting much more serious cases in the superior court. And for people who aren't familiar with it, Middlesex County is one of the biggest counties in the country. We are 877 square miles, 54 cities and towns, and 21 colleges and universities. So we are diverse in every possible way. And that gives us an opportunity to make a lot of innovations, to develop different programs, and to see how we can best respond to issues across the county. And during this pandemic, which as we all know, every part of our life has been impacted. So it's not surprising that the criminal justice system would be impacted in similar ways. One of the things that put us in a really good position was that right at the beginning of the year, obviously not knowing about the pandemic, but wanting to take a look at where we were should some event occur. If something had happened across this county, we're, I wanted to know whether we were in the best position to make that response. So we brought together all of our partners and started talking about a variety of things, communications, how we would be prepared for certain things and started to really do that. We had no idea that we would need it as soon as February, but it did put us in a really good position for beginning the response. And you know, one of the things you see tonight, both with the chief and with the sheriff, we've all been doing this for a very long time and we've been doing it together. Um, I've known the chief when he was on other departments, Peter began part of his career in our office. So we have that good personal and working relationship that allows for a lot of collaboration. And that's really what has fostered some of the things that are, were really groundbreaking here. And one of those was that early on, the sheriff and I were able to come together and it was clear that given the public health issues, we were going to need to reduce the number of people in custody in our county. And the question was, how would we do that? And you know, we talked a lot about what we've lost during the pandemic, but one thing I don't want to lose sight of is we have learned a lot during this time that we can use going forward. For instance, one of them was that we were able to come to agreements with the Sheriff's Office and Defense Council about a number of people who were in custody that we felt it would be safe to release, putting certain conditions in place around that. And in fact, here we were able to release over 70 people. And that's from a population that was already historically low. Out before the court got involved, before the pandemic really became as serious as it would later get to, 
And that was because we were able to work together on that. And that was a really important piece. The other piece was we had talked with our police chiefs about the fact that both in balancing public safety and public health, obviously it was going to be a better idea if we didn't have so many people in cells in the police station, if we didn't have the police having contact with so many people on the street. So we may, we had made a recommendation that for cases that were nonviolent, where it was possible not to make an arrest, but to actually issue the person a summons to come to court at a later date, that would keep everybody safer. And we were able to do that. And by doing that at the beginning of the pandemic, we were able to reduce our cases coming into the court, which of course was closed and we were doing by Zoom by over 70%. So Yes, things are going to change and people are going to be back out again. So those numbers have come up a little bit. But there are lessons there that we can learn going forward, both about who needs to be held, about how we can frame police interactions on the street. So that was very important. The other was we obviously wanted to be certain that people who needed our help could access us. Um, the chief talked about the fact that we've gotten a number of domestic violence calls. It's hard to make those calls if you're in a dangerous situation and your abuser is sitting at the other end of the sofa while you're working. It's a lot harder when you can't go down to the courthouse. How do you make have access to that? It's often sometimes dangerous even for people to get on the phone. So here in Middlesex, we created a text line for victims who needed to reach in real time a victim witness advocate. It was important for two reasons, one of which is because you could do it, obviously, without being overheard either by your abuser or by your children who are also home. And secondly, you know, these are very personal things that people would be discussing, sometimes for the first time. And for them to be able to have that live interaction with an advocate made an enormous amount of difference. And we did that as well with making sure that we were getting resources out for kids. We had lots of kids who normally would be seen by their teachers every day who might spot changes in what was happening with them who weren't being seen. So we turned to who was seeing kids. For instance, people giving out food were seeing kids on the basis that the teachers would have been. So we did some training with them about what were things to look for, what to be reporting. So, and we also continue to do but on Zoom, a lot of the work with folks struggling with mental health or opioid issues. You know, one of the things we learned, for instance, many people in their recovery seek to use a methadone program. Methadone is a great program, but you have to be there every day to get your methadone. And if you have a job, you have kids, you don't have transportation, that can make that not available to you. Well, what we learned during this pandemic is there were ways to safely supply the medication to people without requiring them to come in every day, which was really critical. That's something we're going to take going forward. And then, of course, as we all know, all of these things that we were doing to deal with the pandemic hap were happening then against the backdrop of the murder of George Floyd. And so much of the questioning, the concerns that were arising about accountability, about how do we make meaningful change. So we've been do working on that as well during this period, um, one of which has been, one, well, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit later, you can't analyze what you don't know about, so making data available. And we've been able to collect the data about our cases, the racial issues, what people are charged with, with, what the outcomes are. And we have five years, the past five years of that raw data up on our website so people can really see what it is that we're doing. Um, we've also been keeping and publishing a Brady list, which speaks to indiscretions on the part of officers that might come out when they seek to testify in trial. And We've also spent a lot of time working on things that go to the prevention piece, to expanding diversion, to increasing the age that people are eligible for our diversion programs, as well as the kinds of cases that are eligible. So what's been really very important that I think for all of us as we've tried to navigate this has been listening to each other and learning. And that's why these conversations are so important. So I'm grateful to be here tonight and I'm grateful to all of you for coming and joining us. 
Thank you so much, DA Ryan. That's really helpful overview. Uh, and it's true that in many different spaces, um, obviously COVID has been incredibly disruptive and traumatic, uh, but there have been some lessons learned that we can probably apply even moving forward once we're past this period. Um, and it's good to hear a little bit about the things you're thinking about in that vein. Um, my last guest uh, tonight is our Middlesex District uh, Sheriff, Peter Katusian, and as the DA mentioned, uh, the three panelists have had a lot of time to, to work together. I'm a little newer in this community, but as the Sheriff and I uh, discussed earlier on, I'm very happy to be part of his Armenian community. I don't know how often you all join a community conversation where uh, half of the panelists uh, have Armenian last names, but you're you're at, you're in one tonight. So, um, Sheriff, feel free to sort of just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your professional background and the work um, that you've been focused on during COVID-19. And thank you again for being here. Uh, thank you, Representative. And as I said just before the call, I applauded you for be being an Armenian by choice. My mother was an Armenian by choice, previously being a Cassidy. Uh, so I have a great appreciation that that uh, people that come to the Armenian community. By their own volition, not simply by birth. So it's uh, it's really an appreciated uh, appreciated population within our population. So thank you. My name is Peter Katujian. I know my main my name may say Megan Kelly on there. I do identify as a he him. Um, so don't be confused by the name that's posted. I simply I had to sign out of the computer and sign on to my phone, and that's where I'm calling from right now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with our fellow guests. Uh, my name is Peter Katujian. I'm a kid from Waltham. Um, my previous history was. Uh, both as a prosecutor, but also as a bar advocate, court-appointed bar advocate. Um, and, and those uh, those roles were really, um, uh, really important in my development as an attorney and my choice in a career of public service. I was also a state representative for 14 years, during which I chaired the Committee on Healthcare and Public Health for a number of those years, um, and uh, then uh, was initially appointed uh, by uh, Governor Patrick back in 2011, uh, to fill the uh, unfilled term that uh, Sheriff DePaula was initially going to take and, and uh, did not take. Um, I did not covet the position of sheriff. I did not seek the position of sheriff before someone mentioned it to me when Sheriff DePaula was initially leaving this position. Um, and uh, I am really feel blessed to be uh, in this role uh, because as I said, my, my, career, my entire career has been one of public service, uh, and nowhere do I think you get to do public service in its most almost pure essence of trying to help those that are struggling in justice involved kind of regain their lives, become more fulfilled, uh, to become healthier and stronger and members of their uh, as individuals and members of their family and their community. So I find that this job is a great opportunity to do public service uh, in really a significantly important way. And I feel blessed to have this role. Uh, Middlesex County, as, uh, as DA Ryan mentioned, is 1.6 million people. It's one of the top 25 largest in the entire country. It's also different from most other counties that are of its size because we have a couple of urban centers in like a Lowell and a Framingham and a Cambridge, but a number of other sizable suburban and then smaller suburban and rural uh, towns as well. So that this is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very diverse uh, population and one that is not as easy to uh, run the programming uh, as it might be in others, but by that dint, by the fact that you can't, and we have done so in Middlesex, also shows that it can be replicated more easily across this country. I'm president of the Massachusetts Sheriff's Association. I'm also now president of the Major County Sheriffs of America, which is over 100 sheriffs of the largest counties across the country. Uh, representing 120 million uh, individuals across the country in, uh, in areas from California and Florida up to Portland, Oregon, and you know, Seattle, uh, Washington, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Chicago, Illinois. So really those areas that are going through some uh, challenges right now, uh, and I get to uh, run that association as well, all in the effort to advocate for a more equitable and fair criminal justice system, which I think is really important. Uh, they've also placed me in the forefront of the issues of dealing with COVID, both on the state level and on the federal level, dealing with the CDC and dealing with DPH uh, and experts from around the country as to how we're going to manage this. And I'll just say, it's sort of in closing, I often say the sheriff's offices sit at the intersection of public safety and public health. In, in now being sheriff, I see that more true than ever, the issues of dealing with mental health and substance use disorder, especially. Uh, and especially now we're, we're dealing with the issue of COVID while also dealing, uh, pandemic, while also dealing with the epidemic of, 
uh, opioids and substance use disorder. On top of that, the issue of mental health, which we see significantly here in our place of incarceration. The three largest mental health treatment facilities in the country are LA, Rikers, and Cook County jails. That's not right that jails should be a place where so many people with mental health issues are coming. So that's something that is gravely concerning to me. I come from a public health background. I worked on the OxyContin, created and worked on the OxyContin Commission back in 2005 and sadly see very much the same issues facing us now that faced us back then. But back then we had about 525 or 545 overdose deaths. This last year we had uh, just over 2,000. Uh, so it's really concerning to me that we haven't addressed that as head on. I'm also working with Chief Lyle on the Data Driven Justice Initiative. Middlesex applied and was granted a, uh, an, uh, a grant from, uh, for to be one of three pilot sites by the Arnold Ventures uh, to be a data-driven justice initiative. We've worked with um, probably about 50 of our um, uh, police departments across Middlesex County. We have 54 in total uh, to actually help us uh, get the data uh, to be able to then uh, highlight who those people are that sometimes will run below the radar that we will not understand are those that are cycling into our justice system, cycling into our emergency departments, cycle into our, our police departments, lockups. Uh, and yet if we can get them the help that they need, we can actually um, stop that cycling uh, and actually allow them to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to get them not just out of the criminal justice system, but to the uh, to the to the resources that they need. Also, with Cindy Friedman and many others, we're actually, um, in, I know Kate's involved in this too, the Middlesex Restoration Center, which is another way, again, to get people into the help that they need and out of the criminal justice system. Uh, done a lot of work in here in Middlesex Sheriff's Office. I'll say this in my closing remark. Um, I'm proud of the programming we have here. I'll probably discuss some of it a little bit more. Uh, I don't think you'll find any better programming across the country, um, but you shouldn't have to come to jail to get good program. We should be able to offer you those resources so you don't have to come to jail in the first place. And if you do ever cycle through our facility, uh, that when you get out, you don't have to come back because those resources are available to help you become uh, you know, a, a stronger, healthier citizen as well. So thank you very much, Representative. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, and your comments as well as the other guests just made me think that certainly after this uh, conversation tonight. My office will follow up with all the attendees um, and share with you any resources that have been mentioned in terms of uh, where to go to see some of the, um, the initiatives uh, that each of our guests has described. I think that'd be really helpful for everyone. Um, so with that, let's turn to the topics of conversation that were largely driven by the, um, the questions that you all asked ahead of time. So We've broken, I've broken this out into three different sections. We'll talk a little bit about considerations that occur before someone is incarcerated, before they're convicted. Uh, then we'll turn to questions around uh, decarceration and programming and supports for folks who are in our houses of correction. And then we'll close out with continuity of care, thinking about how we're supporting individuals and the community uh, upon reentry, and what are some um, next steps. And in fact, uh, you've already, uh, you know, each of you in, in your discussion have sort of teed up some of the, the bigger conversations that are having we're having in the next steps. So in the first topic, uh, just around pre-incarceration and, and pre-conviction, um, you know, at the outset, as someone potentially enters a criminal justice system, there's this decision point um, about, how do we address a behavior when a police uh, uh, officer is called to an incident or uh, a department becomes aware of something happening in the community? So Chief, I'd love to start with you and just talk about ways in which um, your department is attuned to, to this, um, this issue and how you think about whether or not there are ways to sort of minimize incarceration uh, to de-escalate situations. So if you could speak to that, I think that would be great. And you're gonna have to unmute yourself. I know I did. I was guilty of that earlier. Yeah, it'll be happening all night. I'm sorry. Um, as far as de-escalation, officers receive training for de-escalation. It's part of their defensive tactics. But when you look at what you know, MPTC, Massachusetts Municipal Police Training Committee, it's a four-hour block. And if they get it once a year, they get the defensive tactics. Um, I don't believe that's enough. So. That being said, we're going to be moving in a different direction in the next six to eight months as far as training for law enforcement in our community. Uh, we're really going to emphasize a mental health component because people with drug addiction and mental health go hand in hand. And I imagine the sheriff's office, they see it quite a bit when, they're, when folks are incarcerated. Um, 
So that's one avenue that we're going to certainly look at. And we have some grants, two are, are revolving grants that we get every year. And the other one's one we're applying for right now to help us with mental health evaluations. We'd love to have a, an advocate on our team, but uh, that's something we have to discuss with the city, uh, city officials to see if we can find the funds to get someone to support us. Melrose Wakefield had a great program for us as far as mental health. And when the funding stopped, the program uh, was disbanded. So that's one of our pitfalls there. As far as de-escalation, when officers respond to calls, depends on the nature of the call, how the officer acts. If somebody's really uh, you know, excited, jacked up, take a step back, listen to them, let them vent, and at the right time, try to engage them again. Instead of using an officer, uh, you know, Lyle or whatever, use your first name in a more calming manner. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And then there's always the opportunity to back away when someone even gets more excited. And then also, you know, things aren't bad to bring an ambulance on scene. Sometimes uh, EMS people have a better conversation with um, people that have mental health issues or people that are excited over a family uh, quarrel or, you know, some other incident that may have happened that caused them um, to be, uh, you know, off center. Uh, as far as diversion, I think it's a great program. Uh, the DA's office, Marion's office, excuse me, Middlesex DA, Marion Ryan's office, um, has done a great job with us. And we, we work hand in hand with the ADAs as far as people that are available for diversion. And we have to also consider the victims. The victims are a big part of diversion. If they agree, we go to a diversion, certainly. And that can be pre arraignment or, or through the courts, it can be after arraignment. Um, and it, we've had very good success with those programs. Obviously, um, they sign a contract, they, they abide by the contract, and then at the completion of the contract, um, everything is uh, you know, disbanded, there isn't any charge. Um, and that could be a wonderful avenue for all of us. I will say this during COVID, um, as the DA mentioned, the, the preferred response in all cases was summons. Obviously, there were some mandated arrests that we were forced to make. Um, that was the big challenge for us in law enforcement early on. The courts were closed. We were actually arresting people. We were booking people here, processing them. And then we were doing arraignments by Zoom and WebEx and everything in the police department. So it was a new, new experience for us, as well as the DA's office, the courts, uh, the judges, uh, defense attorneys were counseling uh, uh, involved uh, persons by Zoom um, in the confines of the Merrill's Police Department. Um, it was quite challenging, and we've seemed to uh, uh, adopted a system in place that works now. Um, in moving forward, I wouldn't rule out, we'd be maybe doing that uh, with certain individuals again. Um, if it works, you know what, it's great. Great, thanks very much, Chief. And I wonder if, um, either the deer or the sheriff want to add anything, including, you know, uh, I think the chief is speaking a little bit about, you know, on the ground practice and sort of protocols in terms of how uh, the police officers would engage, uh, you know, residents or others in a, in a situation. I think uh, in addition to sort of the practices that we have, there are also um, the policies that are established at a statutory level or regulatory level. And so, for example, uh, Massachusetts, uh, you know, passed a pretty robust criminal justice reform effort that also sort of was uh, tuned to this idea of decriminalization uh, and trying to, um, you know, be really attuned to um, concerns about overcriminalization and overpopulation in, in our um, criminal justice system. So I don't know if you want to add anything to what our chief Lyle, uh, chief Lyle has discussed. Mary, do you so, want to start out? Because I know that we both have been doing a lot on this issue. Do you want to start it out and then I can carry on from there? Sure. That legislation, which was passed two years ago now, was really important in terms of shaping you know, in Massachusetts, criminal justice legislation passes roughly every 20 years. So I was very involved in supporting that bill because I think a lot of things that were contained there are where we should be going. And it gave, gave it to the rest of the state the benefit of lots of things we have here. You know, I think all of us can recognize that there probably have been days when we've done things 
that we shouldn't have done. And that is not the thing by which we would want to be judged. And when, especially when somebody is a younger person and that gives them a criminal record, that does affect the rest of their life. And what gives people a criminal record is not even the interaction with the police on the street or being arrested. It's the next day when you go to the courthouse and you're arraigned. Until then, you don't have a record. So we run a very robust diversion program. And the idea is, number one, to maintain someone's status of not having a record. Because if you look at the studies that show you what are three things that can predict whether or not you will be successful in life, the three things are education, being able to buy a house, and not having a criminal record. Those, If you can have all of those three things, your chances of living a successful life are much, much greater because the having a record is just a spiral. So we've grown that program both to protect the record and the second piece of it, and this is really why we see such good results with our diversion programs in terms of people not coming back. I've been a prosecutor for a very long time. I've spent a lot of time in court watching people step up to their bar, to the bar in the courtroom. Their lawyer talks, the DA talks, the judge talks, and then the judge hands out some sentence, especially for minor offenses, pay X amount of dollars, do this or that. Very often there are family members standing there to pay the money. And the person who is the defendant in that case rolls their eyes, the chip on their shoulder gets a little bit bigger, and they leave and we have not affected their behavior at all. Everybody knows if you think about yourself, what causes you to behave differently is something happening that engages your mind and brings you to a different place. Whether it's deciding to be healthier, deciding to be kinder about something, whatever it is. And the problem with court is it doesn't do that. Court on its best day does not really affect people's thinking and engage them in a way that's meaningful. Diversion does that because as the chief said, they have to come in, they have to agree to go into diversion. They have to sit with us. They have to sign a contract. We offer them a variety of programs because we want them to do something that's gonna be meaningful to them. So we try to find out what their interests are, put them in that kind of a program. And then they're required to complete that program. During the course of doing that diversion, they're often gaining life skills, interpersonal skills, lots of things that might have been part of the equation that got them in trouble in the first place. And if they get to the end of that contract and they've done what they needed to do, that case just goes away. And they can truthfully answer that question that they have no record. Um, is I see that Aaron's here is one of the pieces of that bill was a program that we started here in Middlesex that I'm really passionate about. That's restorative justice. That's one of the options in our diversion program. Um, that is something that both victims find very rewarding because often there are questions when they've been the victim of a crime that don't get answered in traditional court. Um, I'll give you an example. Your house gets broken into. One of the things you want to know is, was it because it was my house or are there just lots of break-ins on my street? Where is my stuff? In a traditional prosecution, even that goes well, I can't get you the answers to those questions. In restorative justice, we have an opportunity to do that. So we are in Middlesex County now, a very, very large number of our cases are going to diversion. We have expanded our program to include eligibility up to the age of 26 because I think for anybody who's ever been an adolescent, young adult, you know there's not a magic day when you really become a grown-up. We know that's particularly true and anybody who's ever raised boys knows that. It's particularly true for boys um, and we want to give them as much opportunity to do that. So we, and we've also abandoned a lot of the sort of bright line rules that we used to have that some cases wouldn't be eligible for diversion. And the best result we are seeing is that those people are not coming back. Um, we have well over 70% of the people who complete our programs, two years out, we have not seen them back in the court system. 
And that is very different than people who go through a traditional court practice. So I'll turn it back to the sheriff. Sure, and if you wanna just speak briefly on this, I'm mindful of our time and wanna make sure we get to some of the other great questions we were asked ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I understand, Kate. And quite honestly, I've got a little bit of data here too that I've, I've, uh, uh, we're, we're a very data-driven operation here. I'll just say that I was a founding member of law enforcement leaders to reduce crime and incarceration, which is a national organization. Uh, it's an understanding that we can't arrest or incarcerate our way out of crime or mental health issues or addiction. Um, when I became sheriff in 2011, we had about 1,400 individuals in our care, custody, and control at the um, uh, Middlesex Jail and House of Corrections. That number has dropped precipitously. So we, when you speak about decarceration, it's already been going on here in Middlesex. Uh, where is the number at the beginning of this year? We were down to 800. At the very beginning of COVID uh, in uh, early March, we were at 787. Um, and then we then we actually um, uh, began to reduce our population even further, reducing it by another 30%. At some low, we were at 540 or 550. Imagine that, just eight, nine years ago, we were at 1,400. <coughs> and, um, and we've got about 580 individuals now. Um, the, this was done by through a lot of actions. Uh, this is done over the history by a lot of great work by police departments, the DA's office, I think by good programming in the Middlesex Jail and House of Corrections that all reduce recidivism and reoffenses. Uh, we've done, we started doing this, our decarceration, especially with COVID, by increasing our electronic monitoring program, by working with DA Ryan uh, and other chiefs. Uh, we started identifying people, as, as Marion mentioned, we identified 73 individuals that we thought class, uh, were, were qualified under some low bail and low general low offenses uh, that uh, she could bring to the court, readdress their crimes, and were actually released. This is prior to the Supreme Judicial Court decision recently. By the way, one thing I do want to mention, we lost a great man, a, a terrible loss, uh, Chief Justice Ralph Gantz, just yesterday. He was a close friend of my family's. He was a great leader on all these issues and, and his loss will be felt terribly. So I just want to mention, I forgot to mention Ralph Gantz in this, um, but uh, in, generally in the decarceration, we're allowed to empty out a number of our dormitory units, create greater social distancing and, um, and, and then practice corrections uh, instead of just housing people. So it was a really great experience. So this idea of decarceration has been going on historically for a while now in Middlesex. It was brought to another level through COVID um, and it has shown the benefits of this decarceration, I believe, um, that we don't have to arrest or incarcerate our way to a better community. Sure, great, thank you. One thing that um, you bring up our, you know, Chief Justice Ganst, and thank you for those sentiments, and I'm sorry for your personal loss as well. Um, one of the things that he did in, in keeping with your sentiments here was ask for a study uh, that Harvard Law School just completed and, uh, released last week um, that takes a close look at racial disparities in the Massachusetts prisons and in the criminal justice system, uh, showing that black and Hispanic uh, or Latino people are incarcerated at higher rates than white people and are given longer sentences. And so understandably that there's, that's gonna, we're gonna be looking at that research really closely. I'm sure all your offices are really pouring over it right now. You know, I'm wondering what data uh, do your agencies currently collect and examine related to questions about racial disparities? And I think you've already sort of touched on that a little bit, Ryan, uh, just a few minutes ago, talking about going back five years, but just interested in any thoughts you have, uh, initial impressions of that study and, and the work that you're doing to, to consider, um, you know, uh, responding to it, respond to that issue. You know, as I said, you can't deal with a problem until you know what the problem is. And that's why we've worked very hard to get that data together. The other piece of it is that when you look at some of the findings in that report, it goes back to having that initial intervention. Because particularly before some of the criminal justice changes, once you had that first conviction and then a second conviction, it brought you to a different place and caused you to be sentenced differently. So when you look at some of the findings of that report, that people were receiving sentences that might be three months, up to three months longer than somebody of another racial group, a lot of it was due to that, it was very easy in a lot of situations to, in some communities to accumulate a lot of record very quickly. 
And then when you get sentenced for something else, you're now looking at a, maybe a history of default, a lot of convictions, and that causes a sentence to be imposed that is more severe. Um, I think we've done a good job here with the cooperation of our police chiefs in Middlesex County of really looking at what we're doing, as the chief mentioned, in terms of those initial interactions and trying to prevent people getting on that spiral. That's great. And I think that's exactly right. You know, I saw that a lot of it comes down to some of the initial charging decisions. But to your point, um, it's if it's a, another, if it's a, a second offense or a third offense, the initial charging decision is something of a misnomer. There was a charging decision that preceded this one. Um, so, sorry, did, were you going to say something, Sheriff? Yeah, I just wanted to. So, just to kind of again throw out some uh, some uh, some information. Uh, in Middlesex, in the jail, we just kind of take who's given to us. So we don't have much to do, but we can do something about how, what access they have to programs and to reentry opportunities when they come to our facility. So just to give an example, our population self-identified right, self identifies right now is 47% white, 27% Hispanic, 21% black, 3% Asian, and then a couple of percent other, right? So that's basically the makeup right now. Now, when you compare that, the things that we're taking a look at, when you compare that to some of our specialty programs that provide opportunities, that's really where we have to um, take a look with a, a careful eye. For our medication-assisted treatment program, which is you know, a national best practice in this country, what we see is those, uh, it, it's an initiative to help break the cycle of addiction uh, and incarceration. What we see is those numbers are 80% white, 14% Hispanic, 6.5% black, 2% Asian, and 2 or 3% other. Um, this program is available to anyone with a verified prescription who wants to begin MAT. So we're trying to figure out why is there a racial disparity in here? But we do know that even with drug courts, there's a racial disparity in those that participate there as well. So that's something that we have to take a good look at. Um, and so we're continuing to take that data uh, and see what we can do while inside, even though we don't have the charging, um, uh, the charging uh, responsibility or the sending's responsibility, we do have a responsibility to find out the access to the program to make sure that's equitable in our facility as well. Can I just, and the can I just respond for one second? The sheriff is right in terms of what we started to see in those programs, and you know, for some of our communities, just access is a real problem, um, and it requires us to think creatively. And I'll give you an easy example: the drug courts. We run um, a number of drug courts in Middlesex County. They're incredibly effective. Our, one of our drug courts. <clears throat> We could not understand why people would elect to go into the drug court. Usually at the beginning of their treatment, they're inpatient in a treatment program somewhere. And in order to leave and come to court, the program requires completely understandably that they travel with a member of the program so they don't run into old friends or go places they're not supposed to go. The participant is required to pay the transportation cost of that program person who's traveling with them. So if I'm in a treatment program in Quincy and I need to get to the drug court in Lowell, I have to be able to get myself and my counselor on the T or the commuter rail or whatever it is and get there. And that assumes that there are commuter rails near there. A lot of our courts are not terribly T accessible. And also, for that and now you have to pay double you may not have access to that money you know and what we discovered was not only were people having trouble with that but we've all ridden the tea and it takes a long time and it's cold here a lot of the year and people would not would be riding the tea for hours without even an opportunity to get a cup of coffee to warm up so we were able to get a community agency to give us really short money a ten thousand dollar grant where we were able to then put into use some school buses that aren't being used in the middle of the day. They drop the kids off. They're not needed till they pick the kids up at the end of the day with some drivers who were themselves in long-term recovery. So they knew about no unauthorized stops to take people back and forth to the drug court. Magically, that increased our participation in those programs by 50%. So a lot of that, what we see in some communities is just really access, whether that's money or it's the feasibility of getting somewhere. So we try to be very mindful of that in our programs. That's great. 
I'm going to move us on um, just in a, I don't know if our panelists have hard stops, but we um, are not even halfway through our first of three um, topics. So maybe we'll turn quickly, DA, to the bail system. And if you could just provide a general, you know, few minute overview, I know that's clearly not enough time, but it's certainly something that folks in the Melrose area have reached out about, um, just in terms of how it works in terms of making determinations around pretrial options, including requiring bail or seeking a dangerousness hearing. Uh, to the degree it's possible for you to just touch on the differences between a bail magistrate and a bail commissioner and the qualifications to become one and um, who determines a fair amount of bail, feel free to weave that in. And if we can't get to that tonight, we can obviously follow up on that later. Sure. So a bail magistrate is somebody who works in the court already. So usually they're a clerk or an assistant clerk in the court. And during the times when court's not in session, they go out to the police department and they make an assessment about the initial bail to be set on somebody. A bail commissioner is somebody who just has a regular job and has also signed up to take on the role of bail commissioner. They do similar things. When court's out of session, they go out and make a bail assessment. The traditional cash bail, the only real question before the judge in or the magistrate is, how can I ensure that this person will come back to court? That is all they are supposed to consider. And they are supposed to, having weighed all of that, set a bail that they think is sufficient that the person will come back. Because if you don't come back, you lose that cash that you've posted or your family, if they posted it for you, loses it. Um, the courts have been very clear that in setting what the right amount is, the judge or the magistrate is to take into consideration what they know about this person's financial circumstances. Obviously, a bail of $1,000 means one thing to a person at one end of the economic scale, and it means a different thing at the other end of the scale. And there is absolutely no question that the burden of cash bail falls more heavily on some of our communities than others. And it was that recognition that led us about a year and a half ago to make a determination that we would not be asking for cash bail in any case that was not serious enough that in its conclusion, if there was a guilty finding, we'd be asking for a jail sentence. So that means that in well over 70% of our cases, we are not asking for cash bail. A dangerous determination, which is very different, it's a completely different lane, if you will, is when we're asking the court to make a determination that this individual, for any number of reasons, pose, is too dangerous to be out on the street either to a particular person, maybe his or her victim, or to a class of people. This is a person who's been accused of you know, multiple sexual assaults. He is a danger to all kinds of people out on the street. And the judge is then to make a twofold determination. First, is the person dangerous to that level? And if he or she is, is there any conditions, including the electronic bracelets or house arrest or any of that, that the judge feels would be sufficient to ensure the public safety while that person's out. So I know that's a lot of information really quickly, but that's kind of the differences in bail. Thank you. And one thing that you helped educate me about with respect to the dangerousness um, hearing opportunity is that the law is very prescriptive in terms mm -hmm. of what types of offenses that you're charged with committing can actually allow for a dangerousness hearing. Um, right. It's, it's, it's spelled out in the statute. Yes, right? thank you. That's right. So lots of times something will happen and people will say, you should have asked for a dangerousness hearing and we may not be able to do that because there's a very prescribed list of cases where we can ask for a dangerousness hearing. And one of the bills that's pending at the legislature now is to increase that list and also to increase the, um, and I'm not speaking to the merits of this, but just to increase the period of time that somebody can ha be held on a finding of dangerousness. Sure. Um, out of a respect for the other questions and topics that people are interested in, I'm going to move on, but there were definitely other questions around bail, maybe that I'll just, um, you know, put to you to be thinking about in your office. Right. With respect. Oh, one second. Maybe you also want to talk about this, Sheriff. About yeah, I just, I just, I've got some. I, I just thought uh, some of the trends that we're seeing here, I thought would be of interest to 
uh, the folks that are participating. I, I do want to say that, you know, bail, you know, historically, theoretically, is only to make sure that someone returns to their court date, right? That's just all it is. It's not to protect the public from their danger, right? And that has been used uh, more and more as just putting a high bail because you're not, you're kind of worried about the person getting out and hurting someone or doing another crime. Um, and sometimes it's been used to cover ones um, uh, behind uh, in court to make sure that they can't get out. Uh, but that's historically not what's supposed to happen. And the dangerousness hearing is what, you know, should be utilized. I do want to kind of go through, we're seeing fewer individuals being held on bail. It used to be in our facility, there were two thirds sentenced and one third bail. Now we're seeing one third sentenced and two thirds bail. So it has completely shifted in the population. While the numbers have come down, those jail numbers, those pretrial hold bail numbers are, are kind of still staying up. Right now we're seeing fewer individuals held on bail. Uh, just to get, in January, the average bail amount was just under $3,000. We had about 200, almost 300 individuals being held uh, on, on, at that time. Uh, with 21% of those on a bail under 1,000, um, you know, that was about 60 individuals. And about 63% being held on no bail, that was about 180 individuals. Uh, and then thus far in September, the average bail has been just under $900, so much less um, lower bails on this, uh, ending up in about 61 individuals, 10% on bails under 1,000, meaning only six and 82% being held on no bail, which is 50. So you can see the numbers are coming down. The percentages might swing, but the numbers are a little bit lower. But I just thought it was important for people to see some of those trends that we're seeing here in correctional facilities as well, not just here in Massachusetts, but across the state. And just so people understand, if people are being held on no bail, that is always almost a situation where they are being held on a murder charge. Okay, thank you. And the topics or the, the specific questions that we weren't able to get to tonight, but just for your offices, particularly um, maybe DA Ryan's, to be thinking about, I'm sure you're hearing questions about it, is the Massachusetts Bail Fund, which understandably um, has been thinking about its role in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Um, and to your point, the identification, um, you know, that the bail system has a disparate impact on folks of limited means and a concern that it's long been used inappropriately um, to keep people who simply just don't have the means to, to be in the community from being in the community, even though they might pose no risk. But of course, uh, in the current environment, um, where I understand the bail fund is, you know, um, been more involved in helping folks uh, get bail, it maybe changes the dynamics. Um, and there have been questions in Melrose just about its its role. Um, and you know, I don't know if you wanna speak briefly to that, but I also know we have a lot more to get to. So I'm okay to, to, to go ahead. All right, I'll just do one sentence. I mean, I think in large measure, the bail fund issue has become something of a red herring. Bail should be being used appropriately. We should be asking for bail when we think people won't come back. We should be asking for dangerous hearings when we are concerned about the danger and it's an appropriate offense. And the issue of who actually shows up, whether it's your wealthy Uncle Fred who comes from California or the bail fund, really should not be a factor in how we're making that assessment. Great, thank you. All right, let's move on to our second topic of three, just around incarceration considerations. So, you know, early on in my tenure, I signed on to a letter uh, in early April with a, a number of House and Senate colleagues to the governor just asking for real attention on our incarcerated population, recognizing that they, based on their living situations, were at heightened risk uh, for COVID. Um, and certainly we've seen that play out in some places around the country. Um, and then in, um, you know, later in that spring, the House and the Senate agreed on some legislation that the governor signed around reporting requirements uh, with COVID-19 and included houses of corrections in some of those requirements. So the, the, the bill is uh, chapter 93 of the Acts of 2020. It requires houses of correction to report aggregate positive cases and mortalities of both the incarcerated population and the staff of prisons. Um, and also to look at the total number of residents per facility and how each resident is being held. So are they in a single cell? Are they being celled with one other person? Are they being celled with two or more folks? And there's a weekly report that is being provided on that. And most of this, I think, can be found through DPH's website. Um, so, Sherry, you talked a lot about this, DAU as well. Your offices 
We're really proactive on this point, as you pointed out at the very beginning of the pandemic. I know you spoke with a caucus that I'm a member of early on, and you know it was really encouraging to hear how attuned you were to some of these concerns. Um, and you've already really spoken, I think, largely to the, the data and the progress we've made in decarceration. But if there's anything else you'd wanna add at this point that we haven't covered today, I wanted to pause and give you a chance to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Uh, so I'll just be very brief about this. Uh, as I said, there was probably no, um, there was no DA and sheriff that cooperated more than Marion and I did. Probably quite, there was probably no <laughs> sheriff and DA that cooperated <laughs> at all. Um, so uh, you should be very proud, I, I think, at least, you know, at least for Marion's side, I don't want to say of my work, but we worked I'll together. I'll say to it for him. <laughs> Thank you. But we worked really hard to identify people. And so we had a huge, a, a significant decrease, 115 individuals that we had decrease in population before the Supreme Judicial Court started work. So let me just say this. What does decarceration do? As I said, it allows me to make it a safer institution. So when I'm able to empty out four dormitory units where it's nearly impossible to create safe social distancing uh, and put people in individual cells um, so that they, they don't uh, move around at the same time and then keep the cohorts of movement in very small amounts. When I can actually use an infectious disease specialist, Dr. Elise Wurcell, who we actually consulted on every single decision we, we had in uh, Middlesex Jail and House of Corrections um, and got her direction. So it was always medical decisions and then we operationalized them. Uh, we actually were the very first um, uh, facility. You know, of course, Middlesex had the most cases out of any county. And so, you know, we're not fortresses on a hill. So we had, did have some cases inside of our facility. We were the first jail to at least admit that we had cases, right? So we did have a couple of cases at the beginning. Uh, in total, we also had some staff uh, that had become ill. Uh, we managed every single one of these individuals, um, I think, really well at the direction of our medical director. Uh, we had, uh, we, I think we had maybe 40 in total that had become positive all of whom were covered, you know, extremely well, you know, no, no significant problems with that. Uh, we had a number of staff that also got sick. And then we had about six or eight weeks where we had no positive cases whatsoever. And then we had about a few cases, but those were in a minimum security facility. We're going out to do work release and community, uh, community work. And so that came in from the community. Uh, and then we dealt with that. And now we've been another six or eight weeks where we've been completely COVID free. So I think we did a really good job in managing it. But again, the decarceration helped with this management. Uh, and again, I think it was also made probably with some of my uh, public health background to, to manage it in a way that was more medically driven than simply security driven, I think helped really bring those numbers down and get everyone healthy and strong again. So we've, we've, I think we've managed it very well here in Middlesex County overall. Great. One other question that came up from a several um, attendees was around, and you've spoken a little bit about one of the um, specialty programs that you offer um, to your residents, but around, you know, the programming and re resources that are available, and I'm assuming that's been even more challenging in some ways during COVID-19 because many of these might be volunteer driven. And so sort of interested to hear from you about how you're trying to support um, folks who are incarcerated with um, some of those programs that maybe rely typically on people coming to visit in person? Sure. Uh, we've got a number of programs, all with the idea of helping people prepare for reentry. Um, a few of the ones that we've, we've been sort of given a national best practice, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, we've been named as a national best practice, our medication assisted treatment program, offering all three forms, both as a maintenance, if you come in with a prescription, in induction if you're going to leave based upon the recommendation of a qualified addiction specialist. We've got a housing unit for military veterans, a dedicated incarcerated military veterans unit, uh, a truly therapeutic community, which has shown significant, significant reduction in recidivism, and a young adult offender unit. As Marion said, the 18 through 24 population that make a lot of mistakes, they're still maturing, uh, they don't understand the consequences of their actions. Um, and and, we, and if we can kind of stem it at that age, then we can stop, uh, stop them from a life of unfulfillment and failure and incarceration and justice involvement. All three of these programs have been impacted <clears throat> because we, don't, we can't bring the visitors in. We can't bring uh, the, the, the facilitators in. We have started more virtual programming for those programs. 
now we're setting up, we're having visitors back in, and we're beginning to reestablish those programs, so we will be back on track. Our medication-assisted program, uh, treatment program, never waned. Uh, we're up to almost 100 individuals are treating per day. Again, as the population has gone down, that number has stayed the same, so it means a percentage of them is, um, is, uh, is kind of staying there. Um, so that is still going on right now, uh, and that's something we can manage inside. And then it's the reentry preparation, especially for that, to make sure we're passing off for a continuity of medical care and addiction care that is really necessary, along with the supports of the navigators, those people that we assign to them, that we hire, that have lived experience, meaning those that have suffered addiction, those that have been incarcerated, those that are the best coaches back when they're getting out there, not just for medication-assisted treatment, but those with mental health needs. We have a behavioral justice initiative also assigning navigators to those that are leaving with mental health conditions, by the way, which are, you know, 50% of our population have an open mental health case. So a significant population, and we're bringing, I think we're bringing some significant benefit to their reentry as well. That's great. And actually that tees us up nicely for our, our last section of the conversation tonight. Um, and just I'll pause really quickly say this, I'm learning so much and I think everyone here probably is. So I, I certainly look forward to continuing to deepen my understanding of these issues and I'm really grateful for your thoughtfulness on them. Just around continuity of care. So we've talked a little bit about folks entering this criminal justice system, how we might deescalate in the field, how we might divert uh, before we get to, um, you know, a, a, entering them into the system. We've talked some about incarceration during COVID and some supports that exist and how that's been impacted. But now as we turn toward sort of re-entering the community and supporting the individual, uh, as well as you know the community and its safety. Um, Sheriff, I think it's really helpful to hear a little bit of some of those initiatives. Um, you know, my office has helped out families who have had family members who are re-entering. And uh, certainly during COVID, it's even more challenging to think about things like housing, or finding a, a job. Um, so if you want to speak a little bit about that, and I think I'd also love as, you know, when I am able to send out some more information to attendees and others, you know, having some of those resources, I'll, I'll include them certainly in the email. But I would thank your office for being really available to me when I was trying to help folks navigate that. One, one targeted question around some of the supports that are available is the degree to which you talked about medical assistance, housing, the young adult offenders. There's another one just around job skills and job training. Um, you know, are there opportunities to sort of assist inmates with thinking about skilled apprenticeship programs before they leave? Um, just talking generally about reentry would be really uh, useful at this time. Sure. Let me, uh, ah, I'm on. Okay. Um, so one thing people should really understand, if you're going to do truly good corrections, which I honestly believe we do here in Middlesex, reentry planning doesn't start, you know, 30 days prior to release or 60 days prior to release or six months prior to release. It begins on day one of your, of your incarceration. So the day you come in, we do a full on assessment of what your needs are. You know, what the criminogenic factors that kind of brought you to us so we can address them. And of course, significantly, they're mental health issues uh, and their substance use disorders. But a lot of them are, as you said, employment issues and housing issues, um, social network. A lot of people forget that social network. The people you hang around with are the people that either keep you, you know, healthy uh, and positive or they can bring you down. Right. So all these things are things that we then we create an individualized plan for that individual for the time that we have them, especially with a sentence, the, 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 the jail is different for the pretrial because you don't know if they're gonna be out or not. Um, but then we, we assign, we design a, an entire program around what your needs are to hopefully build you up for the time we have you for when you get out. And these can be you know, apprenticeships and, 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 and uh, professional endeavors, as well as the other things that I spoke about, attending to your mental health needs. But a lot of them are, is jobs, right? Firstly, housing is crucially important. You know, right. you can't keep a job if you don't have a home. Sometimes you can't keep a job if you don't have transportation. So getting people licenses is crucially important. Uh, getting people housing is crucially important. Getting them the medical care, you said that. Continuity of care is crucially important. I call it medical recidivism. Those people that don't have health insurance, especially that with mental health and substance use disorder, are shown to be 33% higher in their recidivism than those that have that coverage. So this is crucially important. So we get everyone signed up for their Medicaid as well. Uh, if we can, when they're with us. And then the jobs, we have programs with culinary arts, uh, some, uh, uh, some of the, uh, um, the landscaping, but we also do programs where we have um, uh, programs with Framingham State University, uh, Merrimack, uh, as well as um, Middlesex Community College, 
to get them into programs, which is really important because a lot of people don't follow up. But what they do understand is when they're taking a college course that they get credit for and they're actually engaging with a professor from outside. And sometimes that we have uh, civilians that are part of this whole thing. They realize they can actually do it and they never thought they could do it before. And that is a crucial thing. And one of the other things that we have done more recently is we've signed up well over 100 to 150 people to register to vote. Uh, we were doing absentee voting for a couple of years with the League of Women Voters. Um, and so getting people to be able to vote absentee while they were with us, we've now undertaken a much more strenuous effort to get people signed up and registered to vote so that they're able to vote when they get back out. Again, I think engaging that civic responsibility in that civic community in a way that will make them feel like they belong, not like they don't belong, and allow them a, a healthier, reinter healthier reintegration into their communities as well. That's great. I mean, one thing that your comments make me think of, and I appreciated the point about social connections and you know, who are you going to be with upon release? I mean, what are the, what are healthy options for you is how critical it can be to have families invested as well. And that's certainly what I've seen in uh, my limited time in this role is how critical that can be, but also how difficult it can sometimes be in light of privacy laws, uh, perhaps, or other things. Um, but, I'm, you know, are you sort of attuned as well to the folks on the outside who may, you know, be responsible, who may need to be the advocates and sort of supporting them as well? So, Kate, thank you very much for that question, because we created a position in the Middlesex Sheriff's Office that we couldn't find a like position anywhere in the country, because it would be people like you, Kate, that would call me, as you have for your constituents, that you would call me and you'd say, hey, I've got a constituent, they've got some concerns, their child is in, is in, is in trouble. That could be anyone's child, right? That could be my child, it can be anyone's child. It's someone's child and we, they deserve, and, and, and so the victims of the incarceration aren't only the victims of the crime, they're the family members of the incarcerated individual. Mm -hmm. And so we actually created a position, I think you might have uh, steered uh, an individual to uh, Lily um, Fernandez that, is our, uh, our uh, family support coordinator. I actually patterned it after the uh, a victim witness advocate, but a family support advocate that can now connect with families to help them address their concerns about their experience while their loved one is inside, the, their loved one's experience while inside. So if there's a concern about the mental health of the loved one or self-harm issue or, or just something that's going on, um, that we can address that matter through the family side. Uh, and then also we can then turn that and create a, because when people come home, I always tell this story, I'll just tell you very quickly because I think it's illustrative. When people come out of our facility and they go back to their families, they come back and they're a little bit hardened from having to serve time because that's the way you have to be. But then again, they're just coming back in. And I know whenever I would go away for a few days with my family, I'd come back in, I'd come home, I'd be frustrated, like if the kids do their homework, is the house, you know, whatever, all these kind of things that you do when you come back. And my wife and my children would look at me like, we were doing just fine without you here, um, just so just understand that, which I think is what happens to a lot of these guys. And then that frustration builds into something more. So now we're actually training, we're, we're, the efforts is to begin to train the family on not just the individual as they re-enter their family, because we do that. Uh, we do a lot of parental training and family re-engagement uh, therapies, but also to get the family, because no one paid attention to the family, to get the family to understand what to expect when that individual comes back into the household and, how can they be almost a volunteer workforce on that reentry support in a way that we just don't have enough people out there as well? Great, thank you. I guess maybe in, my, in light of time, we'll just turn to sort of some th thoughts about next steps um, and you know what supports can we continue to look for um, from you know whether it's at a federal level, a state level, a local level around sort of minimizing incarceration, moving towards decarceration, and then supporting folks who move through the system and, and return to our communities. Um, Marin you, or DA Ryan, you spoke a little bit about restorative justice. I know that's something that all of you all are focusing on, but maybe if you could each take a moment or two just to sort of reflect on the conversation tonight, any last uh, thoughts about you know, what we've discussed or next steps, I think we'd all love to hear from you one last time. And D, there you go. Okay. I think that hopefully one of the things that people have heard tonight is, number one, how really fortunate we've been in this county in terms of the partnerships that exist that help us to do a lot of this work. Um, the second piece is what I mentioned earlier, which is I think we've really learned a great deal during the pandemic. 
in things that will help us to do de-escalation, to reduce conflict on the street, to find ways to keep people from coming into the criminal justice system in the first place. We've learned things about how to help people if they do find themselves in the system. And those things are important that we keep in mind and we keep in place. And the other thing is, and I'm always happy to do these kinds of conversations because I think it's important for people to be engaged. I'm very proud of the work that we do here, but I have the privilege of being the DA because people have put me in that job. And it's my responsibility to be accountable to them about that. And that's one of the things that we have directed a lot of our efforts towards that being transparent, having people understand how we make decisions, whether it's a charging decision or why somebody is being held on bail or not held on bail. And to the extent that people, for instance, the folks who joined us tonight to engage in this conversation have that interest, I think we are all better for that. Thank you. Chief, do you want to say anything? There we go. Um, certainly in closing, if anybody from the community or outside the community has questions that they need answered, please email me. I know that the state representative Lipper Gary Vitti and put my email address up. But if you didn't get it, please go to, excuse me, um, go to the Norris Police Department website and you can certainly reach us uh, through the website, myself or any member of the police department. Questions, uh, even if you have complaints about something else that's going on in the city, a pot light, a, a, excuse me, a pothole, a street light out, please forward it to me and I'll give it to the right department in the city to help you. And my door is open been open since the day it came in and I welcome anybody to come in and visit me if they need to speak to me. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And I just put up the slide uh, that has our contact information. And if folks aren't able to view it right now, um, I'll include our contact information in the follow-up email that I'll send out with some of the resources that have been discussed tonight. Thank you. Sheriff? Yeah, um, Kate, thank you very much for this. Uh, if you haven't guessed by now, I really love speaking about um, um, the profession of corrections and, and, and how proud of them I am of the work that we do in the Middlesex Sheriff's Office, but those officers as well that never really get the thanks that they deserve. Um, it's a hard job and they do a great job for us. Um, I just wanna say uh, that, as I said before, I'm proud as you can tell of the programs that we run. I can show you data, um, you know, very transparent about it and you can see the results from these, but you shouldn't have to come to jail to get good programming. You should be able to get it out in the community. I liken the individuals in my, in, in my care to canaries in the coal mine. The things that are making society ill or sick manifest themselves in a smaller population that ends up being justice involved and then a group that becomes incarcerated. And a lot of that's because we don't provide the resources and the supports necessary in the communities to address their mental health needs, to address their housing, to address their employment issues, to address their addiction issues. We just don't have that out there. Um, and so uh, if there's one thing that I hope that people can take away is we need to invest as a community. Uh, you can't expect police and corrections and DAs to be able to resolve, solve and resolve the problems that are going on in our communities because they're going on right now. We need to invest as a society in these resources, in these supports, so that people don't have to come to a place of incarceration to become justice involved, so that people can live healthy and fully. And I'll say this in closing too. I mean, I see a lot of these guys, I walk through the, 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 the jail and the House of Corrections, and I see these individuals, I speak with them about, you know, how they ended up here in the first place, how they ended up back here again, because I see them over the years, I've seen them a number of times, and, and I see the looks in their eyes, and, you know, people think that they really don't mind being in jail. It's just a criminal. And I see a human being that I see um, a, a, a feeling of the lack of fulfillment. I see a fear of going back out and failing again because they haven't been given the proper supports. I see people that just want to live like the rest of us live, basically, right? Uh, where we don't have to become justice involved. That we, we can live a healthy and normal life if, like everyone else. I see the pain in their eyes as they worry about this. That's something that is, is terrible to see. 
And I think that if we as a society invested more in supporting those individuals, you know, we could have a much greater result and, and, and stem the tide. I call it trickle down corrections. So not just to stop the reincarceration, the recidivism of that one individual, but studies have shown that the children and, the, and thus the grandchildren of those incarcerated individuals have, you know, greater failures in education, greater, higher likelihood of truancy, higher sociopathology, and a higher rate of incarceration. So that we can stem it that one generation, we can bring a lot of benefit to our entire community as well. So again, Representative, thank you very much for hosting this. Well, you're very welcome. Oh, sorry, go ahead, DA Ryan. No, I was just going to say, we owe you a great debt. It's always stressful to do this, especially on Zoom. And I know this was your first con big conversation coming together. So we're grateful. It went I think I learned a lot tonight. I think this really went well. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. I'm really grateful for your time, including to be generous with it and going a, quite a bit over. Um, again, thank you, Chief Lyle, DA Ryan, uh, Sheriff Katusian. Um, I really appreciate your point at the very end there about sort of cycles and the degree to which each data point is a deep and complex story that involves not only the people at a moment in time, but impacts their families and their communities long term. And I think all of you have evinced acknowledgement of that tonight and discussing some of the ways in which you try to serve the humans that you know you meet through the, the justice system. Um, and I'm excited to be able to continue to work with you and learn more from you about these issues. Um, there were certainly questions we may not have gotten to tonight. Um, so I want to acknowledge that and thank those of you who join us from the community. The questions helped us think about these issues and learn uh, more about them. Uh, we can certainly follow up offline on additional ones. Um, and I'm really grateful for your time and being able to work with you moving forward on them. Um, so you have our contact information, you can reach out. I'll follow up in the coming week or so with resources from each of the panelists tonight um, to, to be able to dive a little deeper into some of the things that were discussed. And then I'd always love to hear from anybody in the district about other community conversations that you would find useful um, and that would help us all learn together. So please be well, everyone. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Uh, and I look forward to being with you again at some point soon.